and welcome back to Lecture 5, New Developments of Spectrum Economics and Market Tools. I'm Sarah O. Lamb, and um, I'm a Senior Fellow at the Technology Policy Institute in Washington, D.C. So today for our last lecture, which will combine Lecture 5 and Lecture 6 conclusion, um, I'll talk about new developments. So we'll, we'll be looking at satellite constellations and local governance. So it's a little bit of um, two ends of the spectrum. Spectrum um, Satellites, which are very high altitude, um, higher up in the spectrum frequency bands, and then local governance, which is down on Earth um, at lower frequencies. So today we'll talk about NGSO, um, non-geosynchronous orbit satellites, and low Earth orbit satellites. Um, and then compare those with the geosynchronous um, weather and GPS satellites, which are higher up um, in altitude. So um, when it comes to spectrum usage, um, GSO and NGSO satellites use different um, bands, but they also use um, similar bands as well. So here's a chart that shows um, which frequencies the different companies are using and also the fixed satellite service um, uh, services as well. So GSO is on the left side here, NGSO on the right. Um, the geosynchronous satellites are kind of your more established um, satellites, satellite companies, Intelsat, EchoStar, um, and, and the the weather satellites and the GPS satellites. Um, you have the um, defense contract companies, Lockheed Martin, Hughes. Um, and on the NGSO sides and non-geosynchronous satellite, those are lower in altitude, but they're using similar frequencies. Um, you have companies like here, Skybridge, Teledesic, um, Lockheed Martin, Motorola. This is a little bit of an older chart. Um, today we have SpaceX and OneWeb and Amazon's Project Kuiper as well. Uh, this chart comes from the Office of Spectrum Management at the NTIA um, within the Department of Commerce and within NTIA, there's a division called ITS which is like their technical group. And um, a lot of radio engineers are based out of their Colorado office. So um, you can go to their its.ntia.gov website to see more of what um, these um, engineers are doing within NTIA. Um, so regarding the NGSO satellite um, spectrum usage, there is a docket open currently. Um, it was opened in 2021, um, an order and notice of proposed rulemaking at the FCC. Here's an image of the docket. Um, as a lawyer who reads these filings, um, we're in this these documents all the time. The Federal Communications Commission has like a electronic filing system, ECFS, um, and they collect all these different orders and proposed rulemaking notices, but they also collect like all the comments that are submitted by industry representatives, um, attorneys, economists. So you can look up um, this IB docket number 21-456. IB is International Bureau. Um, and then you can see all the records related to this order and notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, each of the bureaus in at the FCC, they have kind of their own docket numbering system. You have the Wireless Bureau, the Wireline Bureau, um, the Office of Engineering. Um, and so this one, um, and a lot of the satellite issues go through the International Bureau. Um, the current chair of the FCC, Jessica Rosenworcel, recently renamed the International Bureau the Space Bureau, um, I think to um, represent that they're looking more at satellites and space. And I think it's more of a name change, but the International Bureau just uh, customarily handled all the satellite 
issues. Um, and satellite issues are necessarily international because um, what is happening on the frequencies affects, you know, the other satellites in the sky. So this international bureau, um, they do a lot of work with the ITU, the International uh, United Nations. They send um, the U.S. sends a delegation to this um, uh, WARC meeting, WRC, every four years, where they come to treaty level agreements um, on standards and spectrum. Um, there's also a meeting called the Plenty Pot, um, where it's also an international level meeting. I think it's all coordinated out of the United Nations. And so the U.S. has to send like a representative through the State Department, but also the Commerce Department and um, uh, representatives from the Federal Communications Commission and industry. They all um, send a, a team together. They go together to, the, to that U.N. body. Um, to negotiate on behalf of the United States and U.S. companies. But in this docket in particular, um, you can see that the FCC is determining how to revise spectrum sharing rules that relate to non-geostationary orbit satellite and fixed satellite service systems, FSS, um, because there wasn't really clarity before um, before now um, about spectrum shared obligations between NGSO and FSS systems and their relation to terrestrial receivers and also GSO, uh, geosynchronous satellites. Um, there isn't currently a regime at the international level either. And I think part of the reason why is because NGSO satellites are new. Um, you know, you're only starting to hear about a plethora of new launches by SpaceX um, and OneWeb and Kuiper at the, the LEO level, the low Earth orbit level. Um, and so that's why there's this need to determine these spectrum sharing rules. Um, here's just a picture of, you know, you're probably aware already of Starlink. Um, this is their proposed constellation phase one with 15, uh, 1,584 satellites, and they're, they're low Earth orbit, so they're only at 550 kilometers in altitude above the Earth. Um, that's much lower than the geosynchronous satellites that are higher up. Um, so you can see that they are designed to be rotating um, around the Earth really quickly in a, in a mesh um, design. Um, similarly, Amazon's Project Kuiper, they proposed to put up 3,236 satellites um, at a similar altitude, a little higher up than space, uh, SpaceX Starlink um, constellation. They're planning at the 590 to 630 kilometer altitude. And here's a picture um, in a different type of map, not a circular map, but a flat map of what that constellation would look like. So you can see um, there'll be a lot of satellites um, rotating around the Earth. Um, not all these satellites have been deployed yet, but this is the plan. And so with all these satellites um, using spectrum, you also see a concern arising about orbital debris. Um, it's not necessarily related to spectrum, but because the FCC has authority um, over the spectrum, that the satellites are using and licensing um, of the satellite companies and the satellites, um, they are claiming that they also have some authority to um, work on mitigating orbital debris. Um, and they do this in coordination with other agencies that have an interest in um, minimizing orbital debris. The FCC also goes to the international um, forums like the WARC and the UN and ITU. And so they do have an interest in negotiating um, or figuring out policies for orbital debris on behalf of the United States to negotiate with other countries as well. So there's a reason for why um, they would be concerned about how to um, limit orbital debris. It also makes sense because they're, they're approving all these launches of new 
low earth orbit satellites, like 3000 new satellites. And so um, because they're part of the approval process of letting them go up into the air, they should be responsible for how they're going to come down and what happens. Um, how, yeah. And who's responsible for making sure that they don't collide with other satellites up there, or they come back down to earth um, in a responsible way. So the FCC um, started a report and order and further notice of proposed rulemaking in 2020 in their International Bureau docket number 18313. Um, and they're talking in this docket about um, mitigation of orbital debris in the new space age. So you can click on these links and read more. But um, what they're talking about is orbital junk and orbital junk can be in this graveyard orbit um, that just stays out there. Um, it's too, it's in that sweet spot where it's not going to fly out further. It's held in the gravitational orbit of the Earth. Um, but some of the junk will fall down um, back into the Earth's orbit and burn up. Um, some of it might collide with other um, orbital junk or into actual functional satellites. So um, there's a concern about congestion and, you know, the space is huge and these um, satellites are, are, are smallish um, or large, but the impacts of collisions and um, trash are, are huge, um, especially because it's so costly to go clean it up. Um, I've, I have heard of some innovations of like vacuum cleaners or netting um, or um, like space shuttle type machines that can go out and clean up the orbit, the debris. Um, but there is a concern that the more, um, more junk we send up there, it'll be harder um, for what's important and existing to avoid, um, avoid that junk. So here's a picture of the GSO satellites um, used for GPS. So now I'm talking about the, the higher altitude um, GPS satellites. And they're, um, this is an example of the 24 satellite GPS constellation that moves around while the Earth rotates. Um, so I think worth noting here um, is the L-band and legato proposal. And so this is an example showing you how it can be difficult to introduce new um, neighbors or adjacent uses um, next to these GPS bands. Um, you know, it's really important for policymakers and the FCC to, to be able to pack in users um, because the spectrum is getting um, is getting more valuable for use. We want more bandwidth and connectivity. Um, mobile usage demand is rising. Um, and so companies like Legato propose to use um, spectrum for mobile networks um, in a terrestrial manner um, with uplinks and downlinks. But um, there are concerns by the GPS community and recently the D Defense Department and NOAA that this kind of neighboring use would interfere with their mission critical systems, which is true. Um, but this is a good episode to study because it's like a 20 years of um, back and forth for figuring out how to put together different uses, high and low and altitude on earth and different companies with the government in between. Um, so you see here, we're talking about like around 1.5 to 1.6 gigahertz on the radio spectrum. Um, you have these um, satellite users, you have GPS, and then you have um, this good spectrum with good propagation characteristics for mobile um, terrestrial use um, proposed by Legato um, here at 1.5 and 1.6 gigahertz around the GPS um, spectrum. And so there are um, concerns by NOAA, like the weather community, um, and they can be at different levels of crisis. Like a few years ago, there are headlines like 
you know, the weather won't be correct if there's interference from mobile handsets. Um, there are also some like really, um, you know, big, big concerns about harmful interference to GPS. You know, our GPS devices will break if, if there's interference. Um, and so the way these policies go, like harmful interference can seem to grind everything to a halt, the, the concern about them. But really, um, there should be ways to for these companies to work together and to negotiate um, and to figure out how to pack in more uses on the spectrum. And so for our second part of local governance, uh, our second part of this new de development section, I want to talk about local government governance. So we talked about satellites um, really high up in the altitude, and now let's go back down to Earth. Um, you're going to see more and more that there are private um, LTE and 5G networks for more um, industrial uses. So um, these are like factories, warehouses, um, uh, production plants, where they're using LTE on their um, trucks and devices. Um, maybe they're using IoT, Internet of Things. Um, sensors, which was a really big deal a few years ago, but those are also low power um, devices. Here we're talking about LTE 5G, which is a higher power um, use case, and and um, and that's what's being developed right now. So here's a picture of um, what Qualcomm is um, saying that they can um, help support private networks as of 2019. Um, which is different from the public cellular networks that we use like Verizon or um, T-Mobile or AT&T. Um, and so here's a little bit more about how these private networks for industrial applications look. Um, and you can imagine like these 5G airwaves being used um, within like local areas within like an automotive showroom, like within, um, campuses, like corporate campuses, or even stores. Um, and so there is work on how to use um, the airwaves that in a way that really helps industry. Um, and so now we're back to the CBRS um, 3.5 gigahertz band, because that's where a lot of um, private LTE networks are, are proposed proposing to be operated on. Um, and so I just wanted to talk a little bit about how um, local governance happened with the, in that um, band. And so here you see an example of um, PCAST. So in 2012, so it takes like 10 years to find the spectrum and move it into a different use. Um, in 2012, the US President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology put out a report um, that identified federal spectrum that could be used um, by the private sector, that could be shared um, and that could be released because there um, is a demand for more spectrum and the federal government has a lot of spectrum that they're not using um, very well. And so the president, executive office of the president came up with this report finding um, 1,473 megahertz of spectrum that could be used for, could be used by the private sector. Um, and you can see on the spectrum table, the areas are kind of uh, highlighted or boxed out in red. Um, and so one of those bands was the 3.5 gigahertz band, the CBRS band. Um, others of those bands, um, yeah, there were several bands that this presidential report identified. And again, the reason why um, it has to come from the executive office of the president is because each of the federal agencies, they report up um, to, the, to the head of the executive branch. Um, and so the, the federal agencies, they coordinate through um, a council called the IRAC or committee um, that's hosted by the Commerce Department within the NTIA, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, a sub-agency of the Department of Commerce. Um, but then 
a lot of times the Department of Commerce or the Commerce Secretary, they don't have um, enough authority, I guess, to um, tell the other federal agencies what to do. So it has to go up to the White House. Um, and this uh, PCAS Council um, represented the executive office to figure out, you know, which bands out of which agencies could be um, used by the private sector. So the 3.5 gigahertz band was identified. So here, um, again, we see, I had a prior um, uh, chart or diagram that showed these areas along the coastline of FSS fixed um, service um, incumbents um, that needed to be avoided in the CBRS band. But here's also a good image of um, how much spectrum would be available outside of the incumbent uses. So the green is all available in this band, but what's being used is heavily on the coasts. So that's why you have um, this kind of regime where a tiered regime where you need to keep the incumbents there, but you know that doesn't mean the whole band should be go unused. Like look at all that spectrum in the middle of the country um, that is available. But yet some would also say, well, it's also encumbered because there's a lot of light green area in the middle. So that means there's still um, usage in there by incumbents that needs to be avoided. So it is like a complicated um, coordination problem. It would be easier to just clear all these users off and have it be fully available and then auction it off like in an incentive auction. Um, but because I guess, because it's so expensive to upgrade all these federal devices, um, they decided on the CVRS plan, the, the PAL system. Um, so I think it's, I mean, I, you know, I'm not a proponent of this necessarily, like as an economist, like what is a better, uh, what use of resources, like, would it be better to to do an incentive auction um, and and have it be two sided and then and clear the spectrum would that create more value for uh, mobile operators and then also compensate the incumbents um, or is something like this like a sharing regime um, more efficient? I mean, it's hard to tell. And I think if the longer you're in spectrum economics and this field. Um, you see that there are experiments. So the, C the CBRS regime is an experiment. It's ongoing. Um, it, the networks are still being deployed right now. And we still don't know yet um, how well this regime is really working. So I'm curious to see, like, it, is it being used well? Are the PAL licensees um, finding that it's easy to build a network and also avoid incumbents? Are the managers, the databases um, well run? And how do the incumbents feel about this situation? Are they experiencing interference um, and, and, and questions like that? So it's still to be determined if, if a regime like this is um, advantageous compared to a big incentive auction like in the TV broadcast band. But um, for the purposes of comparison, for experimenting, um, I think it's useful to be able to see, well, let's study this sharing regime and see if it works, um, and then compare that with results that we know from a different way, a market-based um, method of reallocating spectrum. So having more data is good, um, having evaluation is good um, before jumping to conclusions that oh, like a, a shared regime like this would always be better um, or an incentive auction would always be better. Um, it's hard to say, and you really do need evidence. Um, and so, you know, this standards development on the CBRS band involves a lot of parties. I think a lot of um, engineers and companies are interested in seeing if they can make it work. Um, and so these are different companies that have been involved in, in the process. There are 250 plus participants, 60 plus organizations that have been involved in the um, development of this 
um, sharing regime. And I guess it's to be determined though, like how, if it's, if it's been worthwhile um, as a, as a way of incorporating federal incumbents, but also the private sector on spectrum bands. And so um, in conclusion, I just wanted to wrap up and look at, back at, at our um, two and a half week course um, module here. Um, we went over spectrum in the news. Um, as students, you have given presentations um, or are currently giving presentations about um, a headline in the news. Um, we talked about the economic um, scholarship that has undergirded um, a lot of what we know about spectrum um, auctions and market tools. There's still a lot of work to be done. Um, I think, you know, it's one, this, this is one of those areas that is abstract and challenging because there's so many different parties involved. There's public choice, there's political economy. Um, spectrum is a different kind of intangible asset. Um, because it can be renewed constantly, um, but it's the legal rights on top of it that can um, give or take away value from usage of the spectrum, and it's the rights of all the device owners um, that are on, on the spectrum, So, and it's an international um, challenge as well, and we talked about that um, through the course. Um, we went through spectrum economics, a history of auction, spectrum valuation methods, and we talked about market tools um, like uh, reallocation um, methods and challenges. Um, we looked at secondary markets, incentive auctions, and other tools such as the CBRS regime and experimental licenses. And um, looking forward, we talked about satellite constellations and the low earth orbit satellites that are new um, and in the news like Starlink and OneWeb. And then lastly, we looked at private LTE networks. So I hope this uh, course module was interesting to you. Um, spectrum policy is challenging, it's interesting. And the more you're in it, the more um, niche it feels or nerdy, but it's, it's really, um, really interesting and valuable to understand the history behind um, spectrum policy, but also um, it's great to see that um, wireless users are using the spectrum better and um, connecting more around the world. And so there's just so many new developments and technologies that, um, but a lot of the questions or challenges arise because of property rights, economics, um, and and policymakers um, working together. So thank you for um, your attention and um, for your research papers. I hope also that your 10 page papers um, were informative um, to you as a, um, as a, a teaching tool um, to learn uh, more deeply about one of these spectrum um, auctions. So thank you.